Before we get started, I want to clear up a few things.、Uh, I am not related to Jeff Sutherland. Totally random, just so that everybody knows. To- I'm not anywhere. But thank you for some people who thought that I might be his daughter, and for the very kind man who said maybe granddaughter. I was like, oh, thank you. That's so, <laughs> so nice. Totally not related at all.、Um, and I want to just set a few expectations before we get started. I have some poll questions throughout the presentation. But I don't want to use a virtual tool because we're here in person. So, as part of the poll questions, I'm going to ask you to either stand or raise your hand、um, to answer the questions. And I would like you to also, when we do that, look around and see who else is standing, because one of the things that we know about the virtual environment is that connection happens when we pay attention to each other. And I'm hoping that through the series of icebreakers or poll questions throughout this presentation, that you'll learn a little bit about each other and have something else to talk about. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to stop and have people talk to each other, like Pete did in his talk yesterday. I can hear the collective groan a little bit, like "No, not again!" And I was going back and forth, like, "Do I want to do it? Do I not want to do it?" But yesterday, I had the most lovely and profound conversation with Adrian,、uh, and so I thought, "Oh, I hope that maybe somebody else will have a conversation similar." So in Pete's、uh, exercise, I went right into competitive. Competitive mode. I was like, okay, I was bribing him. Like I bribed him immediately, and he was like, well, we could just both cross the line and both win. And I was like, oh, yeah, we could also, <laughs> we could also do that. So, thank you,、uh, Adrian, for that. All right, five years ago, I stood on the、uh, not this stage, but a stage at Agile by Example,、um, and uh, I was uh, here. Let's, oh, right, five years ago, I was standing here, and I was. Saying, and I went back and looked at the presentation, and I had said, "I'm not here to argue whether remote is better or in person is better. I'm much more interested in the question of what happens when we can't be together in person, right? So, for most development teams, that is the reality: is we can't be together in person all the time. And my advice at the time was, you should prepare your companies to be remote first, so that if something happens. You can still get work done, and I was using examples like sick children or bad weather or transportation strikes. Right? I would never have used a global pandemic as an example because it seems far too dramatic. Nobody would have taken me seriously. But here we are, three years later, and、uh, you would think we would all be location independent by now, but no. The return to office mandates are rising. Make sure my slides are working. Yeah, leaders are saying productivity is down, people are disappearing, and our culture is suffering. So、uh, a couple of weeks ago,、uh, one of my best friends, Abe from Arizona, came to visit me. For those of you who listen to the podcast, you'll know Abe from Arizona because I give him a little love in every podcast. And he came to visit me, and I had the opportunity to sit in on his town hall meeting, where the company was announcing that those who were within driving distance of the office had to come back at least one day a week. And word for word, this is what the CEO said. He said, "To have meaningful collaboration and promote creativity and spontaneity, we need to have people back at the office at least one day per week." Our objective is about effective collaboration, building connection, and harnessing serendipitous interactions. This is straight from the company handbook after the the meeting. So, for my first poll question of the day, I'd like you to stand up. If you have full flexibility, you can work at the office, you can work at home, you can work anywhere you want. Stand up if you have full flexibility. All right, our freedom fighters in the room. All right, it's like it's more than half, so that's great. All right, thank you. Now stand up or raise your hand if you are mandated to go back to the office at least one day a week. All right, all right. So it's another. So stay standing if you're mandated more than two days a week, or raise your hands. Okay, so the one day. Okay, more than three days a week, if you're mandated. All right, so about one to two days seems to be where people are mandated back to the office. Now, what we know is that the future of work is flexible. I used to say the future of work is remote, but actually, 
people don't care if it's remote or hybrid. What we all want is a little bit of flexibility in our schedules, right? We all want to be able to decide when and where we are most productive. And we can't go back to the way that it was, right? The, in the US, we say the, the, tooth, the toothpaste is out of the tube. You can't put it back in, right? The train has left the station. And many of us don't want to go back to the way that it was. Back to Abe, I was visiting him in January of 2020 in Phoenix, Arizona, and this was his office. He worked for, and this is where he went every day, as you can see, beautiful, beautiful office there. And then during the pandemic, when the company went remote, he set up his home office at home with like monitors and a sit-stand desk and great music, which is one of the ways that Abe and I connect. And when the office mandated people back, he quit his job and found a remote job. So I think a lot of us were in that. We all reevaluated what was really important to us during the pandemic. So if you are being mandated back to the office, I want to give you some tips today for how you can create more flexibility or prepare for the inevitable flexibility that's coming. And for those of you who already have the freedom to work when and where you're most productive, I hope that some of these tips today will help you create a more sustainable and fun way of working. I thought I would start out by taking us on a tour of offices over time. And this is a very generalized tour, so uh, you know, I'd only fit one picture per decade. Um, so I thought we'd start in the 1970s. In the 1970s, you'll see that the open office plan was very popular. And in fact, much of the furniture was modular so that you could move it around depending on the projects that you were working on. And the way that you showed where you were going to be is actually these physical calendars on the wall, right? These whiteboards where you'd move magnets and show, like, I'm out to lunch or I'm going to be in late. And when we get to the 80s, we start to get into the punch cards, right? You would punch in and you would punch out for depending on which job that you had. And we start to see the evolution of cubicles, right? So the cubicles start to come in. And if you were really lucky, you got a cubicle with high walls so that you had a little bit of privacy uh, in there. And just to show that I was there, uh, this is my cubicle in the 1990s. I was a hydrologist in a former life. And uh, what I remember about working in this office was that we had a secretary whose main job it was to route calls to each individual desk all day, right? This is before cell phones. So uh, that's what I remember. I also remember, I don't remember being that messy, but uh, okay, that was a former self, <laughs> my past self. And it, we had these, if you wanted to get a message out to everybody in the department and make sure that they all got it, I don't know how many of you remember these interdepartmental mail envelopes where you would put the, the, the message in the envelope and then sign it when you'd read it and pass it on to the next person. Or maybe you'd put it in the mailbox cubby in the office room, right? And that's how you made sure that everybody got to see it. We get to the now the 2000s, and the open office plan makes a comeback. And in fact, to this day, about 80% of all offices in the US are still in this open office plan. In 2010, we start to see offices getting a little more hip and cool as the tech companies come onto the scene and make a splash, and they're all trying to sort of uh, recruit the younger generations. And then, of course, in 2020, we have the great work from home experiment. And this is my sister with my nephew, Colin, uh, trying to work from home. And one of the things that we saw was working from home during a pandemic is not remote work, right? Like, this is not proper work. Nobody would want to work like this. Uh, and the companies who had remote first practices in place had a seamless transition during the pandemic. It was like nothing ever happened. They were already set up to work in this way. So what we're seeing is we're going from the office first mentality, where the office was the primary place that we went to get our work done, and we're now moving to the flexible first mentality, where the office becomes one of many places that we go to get our work done. And I want to next play you a short video uh, clip of an interview that I did for the podcast back in 2015, when I interviewed a creativity expert from Sweden, and I asked him, like, what's so good about leaving the office? 
Um, so I'm going to play a video next uh, just to warn the tech crew. Um, you'll notice I had, a, again, a different color hair. This is the real color, uh, by the way. And I apologize for the quality of the video. This was back in 2015, so I'm still using Google Hangouts, I think it was at the time. I didn't have the proper equipment. But uh, this is Teo on why we, it's so good to leave the office. So what is it that is so good about leaving the office? What is it about that's so good about switching our place when we work? Actually, I, I would say it's not leaving the office. I mean, let's say you're going to do invoicing. Uh, okay, let me give you an example. I have a twin brother, looks like me. If we're going to do invoicing, for example, which is a good example, I, want, I, I find it very boring to do the invoices. So I want to do it at a very beautiful place. I can save invoices for like two or three months and then go to the ocean and sit at a cafe and then just do that boring stuff in like four hours, but do it at a very inspiring place. So, so it makes me feel good, even though the job is boring. Yeah. My brother hates invoicing as well, but he solves it in another way. He says, I find this so boring. So I want to sit like in a cellar or in a room with no windows. So it's so boring that I do this as quick as I can so I can leave it and then go to the ocean and relax. That's his way of solving it. Okay. So, so when you say, why is it good to leave the office? My answer is, well, it's not. If you find the office to be the best place to work, you should work 100% at your office. Right. The point is, I have yet to meet one person who says, all year round, doing all different tasks I have, and regardless of how I feel privately, I always find the office to be the best place to do all my tasks. No one has said yes to that question. And we've been reevaluating very strongly ever since the pandemic, right? So now it's no longer a workplace, it's a place to work. However, when we move from the physical to the virtual space, there's a number of things that need to change. One is we need better documentation, right? Physically in our office, our, our office becomes the physical manifestation of our culture. Virtually, documentation sort of takes that place, which means we need better information management. We need to be able to find things and contribute to things more easily. We need more feedback loops, more faster feedback loops, right? The annual performance review is not going to cut it anymore. I would argue it never did cut it in the past, uh, but that's another story. We need to master new forms of communication, right? There's now virtual offices and virtual reality and all kinds of new communication tools. And of course, the elusive work-life balance becomes incredibly important. So I want to dive into each of the arguments that leaders are making and show how we can create flexibility using these arguments. And hopefully, you'll walk away with a few tips. So one, let's start with productivity is down. Now, I'd like you to, again, and I know I'm asking people to stand. I can't sit for long periods of time anymore, so I'm hoping you'll take the advantage, uh, take a, uh, the opportunity. If you consider yourself a morning person, you're an early bird, go ahead and stand up. If you consider your, or raise your hand. Early birds, morning people, go ahead and stand up. All right, how early is early? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, all right. How early is early? 6.30. Nine. <laughs> That's a daylight person. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. How about our night owls in the group? Who are our night owls in the group? All right. How late is late, Andy? 1 a.m. All right. Do we have later? 2 p.m. <laughs> all right, like all the way around, 2 a.m., <laughs> okay. All right, so these are our night owls in the group. Thank you very much for standing or raising your hand. What we know about work-life balance is that it looks different for everybody, right? And so for some people, they really like to time box their work. For others, they like to sort of spread it out throughout the day. We are all experts of our own productivity. And I know for me, my ideal looks like, my ideal day looks like, excuse me, is I like to wake up, have coffee, and read the news. That's the first thing I do. Then my neighbor cat, Hugo, comes over, and we go for a little walk around the neighborhood together. Uh, I do come back to my office, do a few hours of work. And then in the afternoon, my husband and I usually go swimming or biking or running. There's a lake right by our house. We can just bike there in our swimsuits. It's totally amazing. And then I come back, do another few hours of work, and then 
In the evening, I relax with my family or friends. That's my ideal day. But what I'd like to ask you is, what does your ideal day look like? If you could design it any way you want, how would you do that? And so what I'd like to do now is just take three minutes and have you talk to your neighbors or somebody nearby, or if you're alone, maybe you want to team up with somebody, but just three minutes on what does your ideal day look like? And I promise I'll tie this into something important afterwards. All right, so let's take three minutes, turn to your neighbor and describe your ideal day. One of the things that became really popular during the pandemic was people creating their own personal user manuals. And I think it started as an introspective exercise to really figure out what is it that we need in order to be productive, and what do others need to know about collaborating with us? I've got my personal user manual on my website because I work with so many people from all over the world. Um, and in it, I've got the languages that I speak, my working hours, my communication preferences, um, a little bit about my quirks, like since I'm a really slow writer. And so for me, I have to just take responsibility by giving myself enough time to finish writing projects. Uh, also, I really don't like talking on the phone. I much prefer video calls. So that's good to know about working with me, right? And I've got this picture of Depeche Mode here. First of all, stand up if you're a Depeche Mode fan or raise your hand if you're a Depeche Mode fan. All right, woohoo, I see you, I see you, I see you. <laughs> all right, so I have this picture of Depeche Mode here because in my personal user manual, it says that I'm a big fan of Depeche Mode. I have been since I was 12 years old. And my father-in-law, who I've known for 15 years, happened to read my personal user manual a few months ago and saw that I was a fan of Depeche Mode, started listening to them, and became a fan himself. And now we've got plans to go see a show pretty soon. I've already seen them once this year, but you know, you can never have too much Depeche Mode. Um, but what was interesting is I've known this man for almost 15 years, and I had no idea that he was into music, because he's a sports guy, and I'm a sewing and embroidery person, and we just didn't have a lot of overlap in the conversation, and nobody else in the family listens to music like we do. My husband, for example, has three CDs in total. I have like three terabytes, right? So uh, we just never talked about it. So through the personal user manual, we found this connection uh, with each other, very powerful. My friend Dea also has a personal user manual. Actually, she's a colleague who does leadership workshops, amazing woman. She has hers in Notion and what she uses it for is she's got a section for if you want to hire her or if you're just curious or if you want to work with her. And she uses this with all of her clients during the interview process, during onboarding, also for networking and team building. So the personal user manual has really become sort of a way of creating connection in this flexible environment. Now, but just because we know what we need doesn't mean that we're going to work well together with teams, right? We don't want to be out of sight and out of sync. So what I'd like to do, oh, so uh, before, I, before I show you the next video, I interviewed astronaut Paul Richards uh, several months ago who said that astronauts train to have the right information at the right place at the right time. So for example, in Houston, where they have the, the headquarters, uh, they've got all the channels open and everybody's listening in to all the channels all the time. So they have to have specific protocols if you're trying to get somebody's attention. It sounded like Microsoft Teams or a Slack group to me, right, where you can listen in to everything. And so he just says that astronauts train to have everything they need at the right place at the right time. And I thought, oh, that's actually really good for teams. So what I'd like to do next is show you a video clip of the interview that I did with Paul and uh, about his sort of what he learned from collaborating from space and what he can bring back to the, his teams on Earth. So if we can make sure to have sound. How did you adapt uh, this sort of training to your teams back here on Earth? Like when you're agreeing on how to work together, what were some of the communication protocols that came up that maybe were uh, influenced by your previous experience? Yeah, you know, um, I think when I was with the Ghost Project, um, you know, one of the things we we put together, we had about um, 
probably about a hundred uh, people on the government team, and and we had hundreds of people on the Lockheed Martin team at, at GOES, and uh, you know there was a lot of miscommunication. So we actually put together uh, in one of our offsites a communication protocol on uh, actually using the phone, um, being face to face, use the phone, um, you know, follow up. Uh, uh, try to do it in person. So we had this protocol because there was a tendency for sometimes people, you know, to say, oh, well, so-and-so is not getting back to me. It's like, well, what did I sent an email three times. It's like, well, did you ever call? No. Well, why don't you call? Maybe they're not getting that email and the thousands of emails that they get, you know? So, so, um, um, kind of just that communication was important. Um, and, and it's the lifeblood of uh, any kind of mission or project. So um, I, what I brought is that importance um, that we did it different ways. But, um, you know, it, it is, like I said, the lifeblood. It, you know, it's all about communication. And you're, there's typically four stories going on, you know, from what you think to what you say to what somebody hears to what they think. You know, even in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you're not communicating 100% what you think is in your head to what the other person is perceiving. And so, you know, that's the trick is how, how do I get most of that information out? How, how do we try to get on the same page uh, of what, you know, what we're trying to collaborate on? And these are astronauts and engineers at Lockheed Martin, right? And they're putting together communication protocols for like, use the phone if you don't get a response on email, right? These are really smart people. So uh, for us normal human beings uh, that are not astronauts, uh, there we, there's a lot to learn. And I'll get into exactly how to do that in a second. But before we need to sort of address the, the issue of information and meeting overload, and Catalog and GitLab did a survey last year, and they found that on average, the number of work applications sending us notifications at any given time is about six, depending on where you are. And that most of us reply to these notifications outside of our working hours, our own designated working hours. And most people find it difficult to switch off because, well, we're constantly getting notified about all the work that's happening, right, with all these notifications going on. And one of the primary ways that we signal to our colleagues that we're online and working is by sending and receiving emails. Now, the statistics say that we check our inboxes on average about once every six minutes, and we check our instant messaging systems about once per minute. And the, most of us are knowledge workers, and we need time for deep, focused concentration. And this constant context switching between our work and our email and our work and our email is becoming kind of a cognitive catastrophe. So not only are we not getting the deep work done that we need, but we're also, uh, the constant context switching is exhausting us emotionally. Cal Newport, in his book, A World Without Email, highly recommended, he says he calls this phenomenon the hyperactive hive mind. And it's a way of collaborating that's made possible by email and instant messaging, but it's not necessarily the best way. And we've all tried to slow it down or to manage it, right? We've got our flags and our priorities and our, and our filters and our different boxes that we put things in, but it's not going to slow down. It's only getting faster. And so instead of trying Trying to keep up, which is impossible anyways, we need to change how work flows in an organization. Now, one example I can give was a small team that was working with a large number of projects. They were constantly in communication about these projects, just email and meetings all the time. And when they found out about the hyperactive hive mind, they set up a dashboard using Trello, and they put all their projects on the dashboard and updated them in real time. So now if somebody needed to know something, they just had to check the dashboard. There was no need to call a meeting for that. So that's what I mean about taming the hyperactive hive mind. And for my next video, I want to play you a short clip between Seth Godin and Matt Mullenweg, who I have not had the pleasure to interview, sadly, although they're high on my list if that were to ever happen. And I want to play you an interview about how WordPress, how Matt Mullenweg at WordPress talks about email. Oh, yeah. So we actually eliminated email basically at the company like 14 years ago. So I, I get almost no internal emails. Uh, actually, uh, a gentleman just joined from Microsoft and I didn't realize he had sent me a couple emails after joining. I was like, oh, sorry, I missed this. Like, uh, um, 
because Microsoft famously, you know, also because it grew up in a different time, email was their thing for a good reason. It's asynchronous. It's, you know, direct. You can bring people in and out. But to me, I see lots of downsides of email. For example, like when someone leaves an organization, how much knowledge is left in their, lost in their inbox, which is kind of gone. All the collective decision-making conversations. And what truly needs to be private? So yeah. what we created essentially building on WordPress, we built this thing called P2, which is an internal blogging system. You could almost think of it like an internal Twitter or Facebook or like a Yammer or one of these other things. So you can use it for project management, collaboration. But every decision in the company is these blog threads where they have comments that are threaded. People can embed videos or looms or YouTubes or maps or whatever is useful to move the conversation along. And we've been doing this so long that it's, uh, it's kind of like an organizational blockchain. So it's like a record of every single conversation and decision that's ever been made in the company. So how often do you come across something like we're looking at a product we haven't looked at in a few years. We're like, why is this rigid blue? <laughs> like, there's probably a good reason. And if you're, right. you know, uh, because companies have so much, so much organizational, like goldfish going around and forgetting everything. Like they just reinvent the same problems over and over again, particularly in software where there's a strong yeah. incentive to like rewrite things. You recreate bugs or, or you lose some of what worked about the old thing. So we're able to look back and say, okay, let's find exactly where it was decided that this widget would be blue. Right. And perfect, <laughs> like we can now tell, and we can use that wisdom and intelligence to iterate on the next. Um, so that's really powerful for us. And um, I think it also frees up people. So even if you're a distributed, like let's say you're not all in an office, if you have a culture where you need to be in the same place at the same time to have an impact or to have your knowledge heard, um, you actually don't have that much flexibility. Uh, so we want to give people as much flexibility in their day so they can design it. Because even like the most progressive office place, like let's say Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook, famously like promoting women and all these sorts of things. Um, if the culture was still like there were meetings all afternoon, if you wanted to leave to pick up your kids at two or 3 p.m., even if that was allowed technically, it might be like subtly discouraged. You're yeah. not working a few hours, you're coming back, you're making them up. But like in a distributed organization, no one notices. <laughs> All they right. notice is like For what you're getting done. Because they shouldn't care. Yeah. So so I think he makes a great argument for why we need to change how work flows across an organization to tame that hyperactive hive mind behavior, but also to remember the institutional knowledge that we have. But it's not just emails that are the problem, right? It's also meetings. Raise your hand if you are Zoomed out. Right? That's like, it's enough virtual meetings. Oh, it's not that many hands. Okay, well, I'll raise it for the collective. I am zoomed out. So one of the things that we want to do is reduce the number of meetings that we're having and at the same time, improve the ones that we still need. And so one of the things that one of my workshop participants said uh, a few months ago, he goes, invitations are not obligations. Just because somebody invites you to a meeting doesn't mean that you have to, uh, that you have to attend. So one of the things that we want to do is just really be intentional about what do we really need this meeting or can any part of it be asynchronous, right? When I was at Abe's town hall, the CEO spent 30 minutes just talking to the people. He could have recorded that and sent it out to everybody beforehand and used that valuable synchronous time for questions, decisions, uh, and important things to talk about. So I wanted to give you a couple of techniques. I won't go through all of these, but I wanted to give you a few techniques for how you can reduce meetings in your calendar. Um, some of them are, are more creative than others. Uh, a lot of people are trying meeting-free days, like meeting-free Wednesday or meeting-free Friday. But what it tends to happen is that leaders will start booking things on those days because they know that everybody's free, right? So that's sort of the meeting-free days is sort of like not really working. One of the most creative things that I saw was this man who created an energy calendar. And so he color-coded all of his meetings, red for the meetings that drained his energy, green for the ones that gave him energy, and yellow for like the ones that were like, well, I could go either way. And then at the end of the week, he would do something about all the red meetings. When I worked for Management 3.0, Jurgen had a policy that no meetings were allowed. If you wanted to have one, you had to convince people to join. And that was great. It really turned it on its head, right? I have to be like, you're going to, I really need you there because you're going to be managing, I don't know, you know, the budget for this. And to here, I need you there because you're going to be doing the design. So I've had to convince people to come. 
Others are experimenting with virtual co-working, where you're actually just working side by side or having office hours, right? So there's lots of techniques that we can use to reduce the meetings in our calendar. And of course, we want to improve the ones that we're already having. And a couple years ago, Atlassian came out with a study that said, if you want people to consider your meetings to be good, it has to have three things, a clear purpose, an agenda, and it starts and ends on time. The bar is low. Like, <laughs> that is a low bar in my opinion. All right, so there's a lot of things, but that's a whole other talk. And then one last thing about infrastructure, if you're still working in offices with these old spider phones still sitting in the, please raise your hand if you're still in an office with an old, sp oh God. Okay, there's still a few out there. This is like the remote participants here, are like mosquitoes in the room, right? You kind of know they're there, you can hear them, but you really wish that they weren't. So we really need, if you're gonna have hybrid meetings, you really need to set up the infrastructure for good hybrid meetings. So in terms of productivity, when leaders say productivity is down, I would say, yeah, we're exhausted, right? Where it's like information and meeting bombardment. So I think in order to increase productivity, we first need to slow down and tame the hyperactive hive mind, redesign our workflows, and then move forward. All right, uh, I'm gonna get to people are disappearing. And I promise this section won't last as long. <laughs> One of the things that we know is that teams that collaborate intentionally will have superpowers. Pete talked about this a little bit in his talk yesterday. Um, and one of the things that I see people do and what I've been recommending since the very first workshop with Victor is that people create team agreements together to decide what is normal behavior for our team. Now, my team uses this team agreement canvas, and it basically just starts with what are our core values, because that really reflects our culture in our organization. We'll talk about that in a second. And then we outline, well, what's the information we need to share? Where is it stored? Do we need security protocols for that information? How are we going to communicate with each other? Is it WhatsApp? Is it Slack? Is it Teams? Is it, you know, whatever else it is? And if the boss sends an email on the weekend, does that mean we have to respond? Like, what are the communication protocols? And then, how do we know what each other are doing? Do we need to know? How do we form that collaboration? And at the very bottom, since the pandemic, I added this uh, base of well-being of what do we need in order to work in a sustainable way to take care of ourselves and each other so that we don't burn out because that was far more of an issue during the pandemic and even now than productivity. We then took the canvas and put it into a Google Doc. That's what my team uses. And because you, with Google Docs, you can comment, it sort of becomes a living document. As things change, as things become obsolete, we document that and then talk about that as a team. Other teams do it very differently. There's no one right way. This is a scrum team that uses Miro as their sort of team agreement, and this gets updated on an ongoing basis. Let folks take the picture. And then there's Allie Green, whom I interviewed. Her team is, consists of digital nomads. So that means that they're always traveling and always on the road. So how they do it is they actually sit down on Mondays or they get together every Monday uh, virtually and they decide what is their collaboration going to look like for that week. And then, of course, there's GitLab with their handbook, sort of the gold standard of company-wide agreements. And uh, for the next video clip, I want to show you the interview that I did with Darren Murph, who was at the time the head of remote for GitLab, and him talking about the handbook and how it's used in their company. But I want to dive into next the, um, the handbook, your central repository for how the company is run and it's open to the public and it's very detailed. So it's not like there's a public version and a private version, there's one version. So why the transparency? Yeah, this blew my mind when I was interviewing and Handbook undersells it to some degree. What it really right. is, is the actual operating manual of the company. Most people think of Handbook and it's some flimsy PDF that gets revised gently and emailed around to the company once a year and you have to take some quiz to say that you've read it. The GitLab handbook, we don't expect everyone to read 13,000 pages of it during onboarding. We just teach you how to search it. So some people ask me, hey, is the handbook too big? And I say, well, is there too much information on the internet? Or did you just learn how to use Google? And that's a bit tongue in cheek, but we just teach people how to find what they need instead of trying to constrict 
the amount of information. It is public because transparency is one of our core values. GitLab has six core values. Together, they spell credit. I would say Google the GitLab values page it is a fascinating read. You'll find all six values as well as substantiating values, sub values underneath. Transparency is a value because it makes us a better business. And when our handbook is public to the world, it reinforces our mission of everyone can contribute. A lot of the GitLab product has been influenced by the community. And if you aren't public with your product, how will the community know how to make it better? The same goes for our organizational design. We want our values to be public because we want others to look at it and help make it better if they so choose. A few years ago, we had someone who was a copywriter find our values page and they actually made a merge request. This is a function within the GitLab program to update and edit some of the grammar on our values page to make it more readable. That is wow. exactly the type of behavior that we want to instill. And the values page in particular is always evolving. In 2020 alone, we had almost 100 iterations to the company values page. And so I say the word values, but in practice, these are the actual tangible ways that we treat each other and the behaviors that we want to encourage across the team as well as outside of it. So in the beginning, when I said that when we move from a physical to a virtual environment, we need to have better documentation. This is sort of where I'm going with that, right? Their handbook is the manifestation of their culture. And lots of people apply to work at GitLab uh, every day. And most people that apply know what they're getting into because, well, they're 100% transparent about how they work in their company handbook. And Darren really brings up a good point about transparency. It is a critical factor about flexible working. Part of group cohesion is understanding what other people are doing. And so one of the ways that we do that in a virtual environment is by working out loud. And I got this idea from John Stepper more than 10 years ago when he wrote this book. He was working at a bank and he was the only one in his department that knew his particular job function. And when the bank started downsizing, he was in danger of losing his job because nobody knew what he was doing. So he came up with this concept of working out loud. And I thought this is perfect for the for the virtual world, right? We want to work out loud and have under others understand what we're doing because people respect you more when they know how you contribute. And they start to question your value when you, they don't know how you contribute. So one of the ways when bosses are saying people are disappearing, one of the ways that we can create more flexibility is by creating more transparency in the organization. Now, I've been a fan of some of these tools I'm going to show you for more than a decade, and they haven't taken off. So I don't know, uh, you know, so I'm going to show them to you. I still believe in them, but they're definitely not taking off like I thought they would. But still, there's some new creative ways of creating presence and transparency. One of those is through a virtual office. This was Sococo years ago. And what you're looking in at is a floor plan of an office. Each individual box represents a room, and each one of those icons represents a person in the room. So you can see that the four of us are cat people. We're down there in the lounge. I think it's the lobby, or no, in the, the lounge area. But if we wanted to go to another room, we would just double click on the other room, and then we're in the other room with those people, right? You can only see and hear the people that are in the same room as you. So this is one way of creating more presence. I've also long been a fan of telepresence technologies. This is the suitable technologies office. They have these drivable robots where you beam in just like Zoom or Microsoft Teams and you can move yourself around using the arrow keys on your keyboard. At their office, it was 50% of the people who were in the flesh and 50% who beamed in via robot every day. And in fact, the store that they have in the Bay Area is not manned by someone in the flesh. It is manned by a robot. And they've got a press release ready for if somebody comes in and steals the robot, right? They're going to use it as like a, a form of press uh, for that. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, there's virtual reality. Meet in VR was one of my favorite virtual reality softwares. You actually just put on the headset, and all of a sudden, you're in a meeting room floating above Earth, and it's spatial, so you can hear who's to the right and who's to the left of you. Um, absolutely amazing technology. Of course, we have a long way to go. The headsets are clunky. I, for one, get nauseated within minutes of putting on one of those headsets, even though I'm a huge fan, so I have to like sit very still with a fan on my face, which kind of takes away the, the whole purpose. But, you know, so we're getting there. The technology is clunky, but I think it will improve over time. And of course, there's lots of tools. Uh, I'm not 
uh, uh, an affiliate of any of these. I'm just showing you a type of tool. So iobea, oh my, there's this, oh I see that's uh, over here. So iobea is a, uh, a tool where you can visualize the work and it connects to each other. So all teams can sort of connect as a CEO. You have a bird's eye view and you can dive deep into what each team is doing. And of course, Jurgen has recently come up with his Unfix model, which helps people visualize their organizational design so that we can all get on the same page together. So transparency can be created in all kinds of ways. It doesn't mean we have to be in the office, right? There's lots of different things that we can do. All right, and for the last one, the last subject that bosses are saying is that the culture is suffering. Chase Warrington said he was the head of remote for Doist, which by the way, the head of remote is a new job function that has made an appearance. It's like we, in the old days, we had office managers, right? And now the head of remote is sort of the virtual office manager of its time. But Chase says, team culture is primarily built by how you work together, not how you socialize together. I mean, having fun is important. Uh, however, oh darn. I had, a, I had a different thought pattern going on in my head and I changed the slides this morning, so that's how it goes. So having fun is important, but it's not gonna, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're gonna work together. So if we go back to what Abe's manager was saying, right, to have meaningful collaboration, we need to come back to the office so that we can build connection and harness these serendipitous interactions. And my answer is like, why should we rely on serendipity? That sounds really random to me, right? Teams that work together intentionally will have superpowers. And we know that Doist and Zapier, they all have company retreats on a regular basis. That's how they sort of harness serendipity. Uh, Pepsi does virtual co-working actually via Zoom in some instances. So you can like show up and actually just be with your colleagues if you want. WordPress does team retreats. So teams can actually famously, the uh, book A World Without Pants uh, talks about a team that just went to Greece for a month to, to work on a feature. And of course, there's all kinds of office exchanges. So my question for serendipity is like, I wouldn't rely on serendipity. I would much rather rely on intentional behaviors. And then when I interviewed Carlos Valdez de Pena, an executive at the Mars Corporation, he said, if you really want to build connection and culture, you need to understand why people come to work to begin with. Right? For some people, it's all about solving challenging problems. You want to dive in and really solve something. That sounds like a nightmare to me. I would hate to wake up every day and solve challenging problems. For me, it's more about who I'm working with rather than what I'm working on. And for others, it's just a job. Right? You're never going to motivate that person with a pizza party or a quiz night. It's just a job. What they want is security and a good paycheck. Like for Abe, he's, he's going to retire in a few years. He doesn't care about the pizza parties. He cares about his pension fund. So when I was talking with Carlos, he had this great quote. He said, you know, I love my wife and we can have all the fun in the world at quiz nights and pizza parties and we will love each other more and more after every single event but we should never hang wallpaper together. And what he means is you can have fun, but that doesn't mean you're gonna work well together. And fun is an important component, but that is not how culture is built. So for my next question, and my last question to you, is I would like you to just take three minutes and talk to your neighbors again and answer the question, what do you need to feel connected on a team? For me, it's transparency. I need to know how my work fits into the bigger picture, right? But for you, what is it that you need to feel connected? So our last three minute conversation, um, and then we'll wrap it up. Oh, I see, that was my own timer. I had no idea that it would make noise. Ha, <laughs> huh, that's funny. I was really like, is there a fire? <laughs> totally confusing. That has never happened before, even during the practice sessions. All right, so when I asked this question in a workshop a couple of weeks ago, this was the word cloud that was formed during the workshop. And as you can see, communication, transparency, a common language, knowledge sharing, empathy, a safe place. 
Nowhere on this list do I see pizza parties. I don't, see, I don't even see vacations or money on this list. So when leaders come to me and ask, how can I help my team feel more connected? How can I make them feel like they belong to the organization? My answer is, you've got to ask them, right? Ask your team, what is it that they need to feel connected? And then build the environment that they need because it's so different for every team. Like I said before, connection happens when we pay attention to each other. So we need to find new ways of paying attention to each other that doesn't involve coming to the office if we want to work in a flexible first way. So like I've said, we know the future of work will be flexible. None of us want to go back to the way things were before. Like the way we work has fundamentally changed. And it's in everybody's interest to make this work, right? As individuals, we get the freedom to design our days around the things that make us happy. And our companies get a stronger and more connected workforce that is not dependent on location. And if we want to do, create and prepare for flexibility, we can start by creating our own personal user manuals, taming the hyperactive hive mind within our teams, reducing the number of meetings that we have and improving the ones that we still need, try to have the right information at the right place at the right time, creating transparency in order to create more group cohesion, and of course, understanding what we need to feel connected on a team. Is that all? <laughs> so it's, it's not easy, but it is possible. And I have hundreds of interviews now with teams who are rocking this remote world. So we know that it is possible. So just to end, I want to say, if you do have to go back to the office, I hope that you don't go backwards in time. And I want to thank you for showing up today and for your engaged participation throughout. I really appreciate it. Thank you. What an amazing talk. Uh, thank you, Lisette. So there are quite a few questions. Uh, I need to congratulate to the author of the first question that, that was uh, the most voted because it's actually uh, five questions in one. Uh, very good one, especially in 160 characters. That's a talent. Um, so well, let's start with this one. Uh, what is the impact of remote, flexible work on creativity, innovation, team formation, company culture, etc.? <laughs> <laughs> oh, just that? <laughs> what is the effect of remote work on that? Impact. The impact. I think it, I mean, this is going to be that, one of those random answers, but it depends on the team. Some teams are thriving in this world, right? They're like WordPress. They are thriving. Zapier, thriving. Doist, thriving. There are hundreds of teams that are thriving in this new world. So what I would say, what is the impact? It depends on the team. There's other teams that are not thriving, and they're going back to the office. Also fine. I'm reminded of this every day because my husband hates working from home, like hates it with all his heart. And uh, he's actually looking for work now and he's specifically looking for work in an office. So that's why I say the future is flexible. We all get to decide what we want. So for me, the impact is, I think that it only improves. Flexibility only improves things. But uh, there's lots of companies that are still struggling. Okay, so uh, another question is, don't we over-focused with productivity concept when we talk about remote office flexibility so we forget about, forget about eff effectiveness, especially in complex work? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think, I think the whole conversation about productivity is the wrong conversation. We are, we are just as productive. And the data that the leaders are using that's saying, I've heard anywhere from 10 to 25% has uh, productivity has decreased, anywhere from 10 to 25%. But I can't find the data that they're using. I think it's anecdotal. They're seeing that productivity has decreased. And it's true, productivity does decrease in some organizations because they're doing it wrong, in my opinion. So I think the focus shouldn't be on productivity. The focus should be on sustainable work practices so that we don't burn out. Most of us are on this treadmill and it's exhausting. So let's create more sustainable routines and not focus so much on how productive and getting the most out of every minute of every day. That's just, we're not robots and we shouldn't be treated like robots. There's one more question I'm really curious about as well. So why do people dislike cameras in online meetings? Why do they dislike, dislike online meetings? Dislike cameras. 
ca using cameras on the online meetings. Cameras and online meetings. Oh, there's a lot of different reasons that people don't like their cameras on, right? Some of them valid. Most of the time, though, it's because people are multitasking and they don't want you to know, right? That's <laughs> mostly we don't want our cameras on because we're multitasking. Okay, so I'm not wrong. Thank you. <laughs> on this sounds wrong. But there are valid reasons, right? I had a colleague who had surgery on her eye and had like a huge black eye for a couple of weeks. I wouldn't want to be seen on video then either. And video technologies become a lot more sophisticated. A lot of people are distracted by seeing themselves and now you can hide your self view, right? There's, there's all kinds of things that we can do. But I would say that Turning your video on or off is a team decision, and that's part of your team agreement. What kind of culture do you want to have in your own meetings? <laughs> Thank you. I think that also answers the question, can we do something with that? Yes. Um, there, is, there are two questions that are interconnected. One is, do you like Star Trek? Oh, I, <laughs> who are my Trekkie fans? I, yes, I love Star Trek. Love um, it. In fact, I spend the end of my day is an old-fashioned and Star Trek. That's how I end almost every single day. So uh, <laughs> live long and prosper, fellow Star Trekkies. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so another question about Spock. Do you think that Spock was an agile coach? coach? <laughs> <laughs> it was very logical, that's for sure. <laughs> I don't know, we all learned a lot from Spock, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so maybe maybe the last one. Um, so we say we want flexibility in our agendas, yet we fill them 100% almost every day. Does this contradiction point uh, at some at something like uh, possibly there is some deeper issue? Yeah, I can't. Say, you know, th th that is the thing about remote is you know when we're in the office, the discipline is sort of there for us, right? You can you show up at a certain time and you leave at a time and you leave it all behind. And when we work remote, we have to take responsibility for our own schedules, which is why I say start with the personal user manual and really understand what you need. And if you're filling your calendar back to back, I mean, one of the things that Cal Newport says is in his book is. Uh, that we should leave 10 to 15 minutes after every meeting, one, to take a break, because we need to take more breaks. The data shows that we need to take more breaks. And every meeting, there's always something you have to tie up after the meeting. You've got to send a file, or you want to send that email, or just whatever you need. And you need that extra time to take care of those things. And if you've scheduled meetings back to back all day long, not only are you toasted at the end of the day, uh, but you've also got all those little things to take care of, right? You've got this list of like things you said you were going to do in all the meetings. So. Um, I think it's just good practice to schedule more breaks in between every, every single meeting. When I interviewed NASA almost 10 years ago, they had a policy uh, that for every 45 minutes of virtual meeting, they would take a 15 minute physical break because they have scientists all over the world and they have day long meetings. So for every 45 minutes, their rule of thumb was we need 15 minutes of a physical break. And I think that's a great practice that we can all take back with us. Okay, there's, there are, there's quite a few questions, and I have like a huge recommendation to all of you that uh, I will share with you my experience that the best part of every conference is coffee break. And you can make it even better if you will connect to speakers or other people in the room and uh, try to ask those questions and try to find an answer together. Uh, and I know that also all of the speakers are usually uh, very open, and I know that there is to any questions and any discussion over coffee. Uh, so I encourage you to, to do that, uh, and do that not only with Zeta but uh, with any speaker. And uh, I also could tell you that I sometimes feel, see the speakers who are, you know, standing somewhere and they are alone there, uh, nobody approaching them, and they are a little bit bored because they are actually looking for the connection. So <laughs> We're not bored. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so, so if you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to ask it to, to any speaker or to Lisette uh, later on. Uh, so thank you very much, Lisette, uh, one more time. Thank you all. Thank you.